No, I'm just, the problem is when the class is done, I gotta be able to get to it and shut it off, and sometimes it's not the easiest thing to reach. Okay, all right, we're gonna start, we're gonna get ready and get started in our class. So before we get started, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our class. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the day. Thank you for bringing us here today and giving us the privilege to be able to meet together here um, without concern for um, the inability or the, the outlawed uh, you know, Christianity like some other countries have. Uh, we, we, we thank you for, for, for allowing us to study your word, to look into your word, and to know you. It's a privilege that we have to look into the perfect law of liberty, to be uh, workmen, to to be workmen who are not ashamed to study your word mm -hmm. and who uh, seek to handle it aright. That we don't need to stand ashamed before you, Lord. We pray that you be with us in our study here tonight, in our concluding class on predestination, and that you would be glorified, and that whatever we say would be true and right, and that we would learn, and not only that, but we would be able to help others know your will and truth as well. We thank you and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to wrap up the class. It's going to be a little bit... Um, we're going to do some review because it's been three weeks since we've been here, and <clears throat> it's been three weeks since we've talked about the topic at hand. So, as I have prepared for tonight's classes to be kind of like a conclusion, somewhat of a, you know, a wrapping up of it, I thought, you know, what would be the best way to do that? And I thought, well, <clears throat> when I first thought of the concept of predestination, you know, <clears throat> there's really two ideas that stand when it comes to the idea of predestination, and that is what most people think it is, and that is God is has arbitrarily, in accordance with, you know, his, quote, good pleasure, has determined individuals. And whether it be people being in, uh, determined to go to heaven to be saved, or they are determined to to not be saved, and uh, I've read both sides of the argument quite a bit, and I thought, you know, as I looked at some of these, and there's a couple we're going to look at here today that are that are not that are from a, a very popular religious source that kind of paints the picture of what most people believe predestination is. And they hinge it on this idea of God's sovereignty. And I thought about that. So I, as I pulled up, I got the definition of sovereignty here pulled up for everybody to see. And I want to I want to start there. So sovereignty, and I just Googled it. I mean, Merriam-Webster might have a more, a bigger definition. But sovereignty is defined as supreme power or authority. The authority of a state to govern itself or another state, or a self-governing state, like sovereignty, sovereign nations, and things like that. But the word sovereignty itself means supreme power. What if they don't know what it means? Or if they don't understand that a person can have authority, but not have absolute control over what everybody does. And here's what I mean by that, I guess. Um, the state has sovereignty here, Pennsylvania does, and to make laws, right? They have posted speed limit signs out there, right? I don't, I think it's 55 right out here, 45, something along this line. Anyway, they're sovereign. They have the authority to set the speed limit out there, right? But do they force me to drive the speed limit? Or am I able to choose to either drive the speed limit or pass it or below it? Can I choose whether or not I obey that law? Okay. Well, that that is a good a good analogy of the way God is. God has absolute power. 
Matter of fact, Jesus said, Matthew chapter 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. All authority. Which means, if he has all authority, I have none. <laughs> it's all with him. I don't have any. But at the same time, just because Jesus has all authority to, to, uh, to convene creation the way he decides to, and to give commands, go into all nations, make disciples, in the context of Matthew 28, uh, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I've commanded you, right? He has the authority to give these commands. He has the authority that he teaches by. But <clears throat> does Jesus force me to do anything? Did Jesus force the disciples to do anything? He didn't. So the idea of being sovereign requiring the concept of absolute control like robotics you know I place here I place there there is no control or no there's no choice in the matter is foreign it's it's just not true so you can be sovereign and still have free will they can coexist the idea of sovereignty is just merely the idea of who has the authority and that's really you know where I think a lot of people have their issue who has the authority God does Okay, so when people start talking about sovereignty when it comes to predestination, okay, they're mixing terms that ought not be mixed. Okay, um, to give you a recap of this idea of predestination, um, in the Bible, in the scriptures, there are four places where the word predestination or some form of it is found, and it's in Romans chapter 8 and Ephesians chapter 1. And, and in both of those places, if you do a cursory reading of it, you might say, well, God has predestined people, certain people, individuals, to something. Because what, what you'll never find, by the way, in the scriptures is anybody said to be predestined to be condemned. You'll never find that anywhere in the scriptures because it's not there. The only thing you find is phrases such as being predestined to adoption of sons or predestinated us to this or that, okay? So, if you only have one side of the equation and you look at it and you say, well, what does this word predestinated mean? Wouldn't it stand to reason that you ought to look a little deeper into what it's actually saying? Right? So we looked at Ephesians chapter 1, if you remember that, and we found in Ephesians chapter 1, in fact, matter of fact, I, I watched some videos on this, and there's a man out there who uh, has a, I think a website called Cross Examined or something like that and he does a lot of these little answers where students, he does lectures and stuff and students will stand up and say well, you know, if God gave us free will, then how, you, know, what, you know where does predestination come into that and they'll, they'll ask a question about Romans chapter 8 or something like that and he'll say, well that passage is not talking about that or Romans chapter 9 which I actually agree with, but the problem is in his discourse he turns around and says, well, Ephesians chapter 1 is saying we're predestined. And, uh, you know, I take issue with that because in the context of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12, it tells us that there are, uh, the predestination, it regards who has the, um, who has been brought forth as God's children in the sense of, you take a look at Paul who says, who's telling the Jews that they had the privileges they, in, in the book of Romans, in the book of Hebrews, they had the privileges uh, of being the ones to whom God gave his word, okay, and all this. So God chose the Israelites as his special people. Is that true? Yeah, it is. He tells them why. It's not because you're mightier than anybody else or because your own name, because your own righteousness. It's because of my choice. I chose you because that's what I decided to do. But <clears throat> the choice of God choosing Israel has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with bringing forth the Christ who brings about salvation, but it doesn't have anything to do with a person and a person being saved or not saved. It has nothing to do with that. Romans chapter 9, for example, if you look at the passage, as a matter of fact, let's start our lesson there. Romans chapter 9. You take a look at Romans chapter 9, which is, I mean, a lot of people look at this passage and they'll say, see, this is talking about certain people being predestined, you know, to life or condemnation. And here it is. 
And in chapter 9, oh, let's see here. Okay. So in verse 10, it says, Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even our father Isaac, for the children uh, not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, The older shall serve the younger, as it is written. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, which is a reference to Malachi chapter 2, I believe, or chapter 1. At any rate, if you look at that passage, it says, see, God is choosing people. He's predestinating people. Well, here's my question. Has God made a choice in this passage? Yeah. Yes, he has. Okay. Did he make the choice before or after the children were born? Before. Okay, uh oh, it's starting to look like predestination. Like the people don't have free will. But what does this passage actually say that God has chosen them to do? It was said to her, to Rebecca, what? The older will serve the younger. Exactly. So what did God choose? God chose that instead of the older having the birthright, which was the normal way of doing things, that the younger, Jacob, was going to serve as the birthright and through whom the Christ would come. That's all there is to this passage. Okay? It is not about God predestinating people to salvation or condemnation. It has to do with God choosing, because remember, the 12 patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and where are we in this, this lineage? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Okay, who, who, who came from Jacob? Jo well, the 12 patriarchs, right? Yeah. Okay, well, God made a choice between who, which of the two twins, the line was going to come through. It has nothing to do with a particular person's salvation. As a matter of fact, when you look at Malachi, when the 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 um, quote where the quotation comes from, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, Malachi was written far after their lives were already done, gone. Okay, so what the quotation here is saying is that Jacob and what he did was approved by God. God loved Jacob and the things he did. He didn't love Esau. Remember what Esau did? What? Just give me a few things that Esau did. He sold his birthright, right, for a for a cup of soup. Okay, he was a profane person. The scripture says. What else did he do? He went and took from the Canaanites when he wasn't supposed to the wives that he had. Right? They told him not to. What else did he do? He became the father of the Edomites, didn't he? Right? Edom. Esau is Edom. We're told. What did Edom do to Israel? Wouldn't pass through the land. With any opportunity they had to um, oppress Israel, they took it. And they did. Okay? So did God know that they were going to do that beforehand? Of course he did. Perhaps that's why he said the older is going to serve the younger. And if you look at, you know, you look at the lives of Jacob and Esau, okay? You say, well, that didn't come true because there's no record of Jacob serving Esau. Well, that's true in the persons, yeah, but it's yeah. not true of the lineage. In the, of the lineage, it's not true of the nations. Right. Okay. Because Edom did serve the kings right. that came from Jacob. Okay. So it's just an understanding of how that comes. So Romans chapter nine is not talking about predestination as far as that goes. Right. Romans chapter eight, which is what we've been looking at this just about this entire time, around verse twenty nine, when he says. Um, and we know that all things work together uh, for good to those who love God. Again, talking, who are those that love God? Refresher. Those who do His will. Those who do His will, right? If you love me, keep you will keep my commandments. That's very clearly Jesus' words. If you love me, you keep my commandments. Who are those that keeps His commandments? Those who love Him. Okay, those who love Him, but <laughs> that's a little circular. But Christians. Christians, right? Christians do the will of God. If you do the will of God, you're going to be a Christian. There's no way around it. Okay? All right? 
Christians, those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. All right? Those who are the called, those who love God, same group of people, Christians. Right? According to his purpose. Protethemi. Remember, we talked about that word at length. Okay, what was that word protheism to mean? What does that what does that mean again? <laughs> All right, that word means to stand before, to set before, and in the context here, it is talking about the purpose purpose of God, which was foreordained from before the foundation of the world. Right, foreordained from for, was anybody alive before the foundation of the world? No, other than God. Right. But it was at that time, somewhere in eternity past, that God set all of creation before his eyes and said, here's what's going to happen. Okay? And we, you know, if you remember, you know, we talked about things like, you know, did God know that Adam and Eve were going to fail? Yes. Did it surprise him? No. Okay? And why do I know that? Because in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, it says that Jesus Christ was foreordained for the, for the foundation of the world. Who is Jesus Christ? The Savior. Why would you need a Savior if ordained from before you created anything? Why would you need that in your mind before you ever created anything if you didn't know things were going to follow up? Okay? So yes, God knew. That's why you had Christ as foreordained. It's not that big of a deal, right? So we go through this, we look at it, and we see it says, For those for whom he foreknew, and these are some of the points I just want to reiterate before we conclude this. Okay, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined, hold on a minute, to be conformed to the image of his son. Stop. For those for whom he foreknew, this is where the, the, the religious world at large says God's foreknowledge includes the choosing of individual peoples to be conformed to the image of his son. And we're going to stop right there. I'm going to pull up this website right here. This is something, this is a website called God Questions. And I really hate advertising for them because 90% of the time they're wrong in what they say, particularly when it comes to this kind of stuff. The question is asked to them, and this is not, this, there's several that, that you can go to to find this, but this is, this is uh, one I go to to sample from because their format is concise enough where I don't have to wade through a ton of garbage to get to the point. All right, their question, what is predestination? Is predestination biblical? Here's their answer. Romans 8, 28 and 30 through 30 tells us, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and that he, those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, those he justified, he also glorified. And then Ephesians 1, 5, and 11 declare, He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. In Him we are also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. Okay? Many, have, many people have a strong hostility to the doctrine of predestination. However, predestination is a biblical doctrine. Okay? Predestination... That is, the concept of something being predestined is a biblical doctrine. Something is predestined, right? The word's not there for nothing. Okay, but listen to what he says. The key is understanding what predestination means biblically. biblically. Okay? The word translation predestined in the scriptures reference above are from the Greek word proorzio, uh, pro which carries the meaning determined beforehand, okay? We don't need to go through all that because we know what predestined mean, means, all right? <coughs> the most common objections to the doctrine of predestination is that it is unfair. Why would God choose? Now, listen to what they say. Well, let me back up a second. Essentially, I'm up here now. Essentially, God's, God predetermines that certain individuals will be saved, okay? That's their conclusion right there. That's basically their, you, that's what they conclude. So they believe that God has chosen one for salvation, one for condemnation. Okay? Which, by the way, if you look at it, when Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, right? For difficult is the way, wide is the way uh, that leads to life, but broad is the way it leads to, to condemnation. So God, according to this perspective, God foreknew that there would just be a few people who would be saved. 
but that he would create all those who would be condemned anyway. And what I mean by that is, they say that God created him to be condemned. And, I mean, you see what I'm saying? <clears throat> because if he created this group to be saved, that is, look what their statement says. Essentially, God predetermines that certain individuals will be saved. What is the implication of that statement? God then chooses or predetermines that other individuals will be condemned. condemned. Right? Well, you look at the scriptures and you see that Jesus said most people are going to be condemned. <laughs> so then what you are left with, according to this doctrine, is the impunity of God's character that says God in his malevolence, his evil nature, has created some people to be with him, but most people not to be, and to be suffered a torturous death. That's what you're left with. Is that God? Is that really God? All right. Most common objection to the doctrine of predestination is unfair. Why would God choose certain individuals and not others? The important thing to remember is that no one deserves to be saved. This is theological garbage. Okay? Okay. No one deserves to be saved. Is that true? I'm going to say yes, and here's what I mean. Nobody has earned God's favor. Nobody has done good enough to where God says, okay, you deserve to be with me. Okay, in that sense. I get it. But what does that have to do with some people being saved and some people can, being condemned? What makes those people who are saved so special? What's the difference? If God, again, listen, if God arbitrarily, according to what they say is his good pleasure, chooses some to be saved and most everybody else to be condemned, where's the, where's the standard? That, well, isn't that saying that if, if God's already selected this person to be saved, then he deserves that? He would have to deserve it somehow. Yeah, because they turn around and say, but nobody deserves it. So Exactly. So here's the, here's, the, here's the idea. Nobody deserves to be saved, but these guys over here must have done something that brings them worthy in, in God's sight somehow. But it has to be before they were ever born. Because remember, it's prede predestined. You see, the, you see the mess you get yourself in with this? Hold on one second. I, I see you. Just one second. So it's predetermined, which means before anybody was ever born, God said, you, 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 you are going to be saved. You don't know it, but that's going to be the case. All the rest of you, you're out of luck. I'm going to create you anyway, but you're going to be created to go to hell and suffer eternally. That's not just. And that's not the God I see in the scriptures. Go ahead, Chris. Well, first, that's not a loving God. And why would he even say he wished that all would be saved if he, that would be. If he knew. Yeah. It's, you know what this does? This makes God a narcissist. This makes God somebody who wants to look good, but isn't good. Here's what I mean. I'm going to give you the option, the choice, in quotes. And it's over here in your, your realm of choosing me. But in reality, I've predestined you. So you're out of luck anyway. So I want to make it look like I made the effort to give you the choice. But you don't really have the choice because I've, I've taken care of you beforehand. You can't have it both ways. You can't have individuals predestined to be condemned and yet have the choice to not be condemned. You can't have it both ways. Can you? How can you have it both ways? Again, I can't stress the point enough. This is what most people believe. They believe that God beforehand chose individuals to be saved. This is where Calvinism is. This is where TULIP comes in. 
total hereditary depravity and all this kind of stuff, right? All this garbage, the, all this theological circusry, you know, circus hood that they come up with, all this stuff that they have to twist and make up to make their doctrine seem right. It says here, okay, look, he says, the most common objection is this is not fair. Why does God choose some and not others? It's important to remember that no one deserves to be saved. We have all sinned and are all worthy of eternal punishment. Okay, so the scriptures tell us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. I get it. That doesn't explain their position. And the idea of some people, remember, we're not deserving. What does That has nothing to do with it. That means they should all die because they've all sinned. Of course, that, that doesn't because there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile, no distinction between male and female, and all this stuff. That we all, matter of fact, the Scripture tells us that God has placed all under sin, condemned us all under sin. So that being the case, where do these special people pop up? The ones who are saved. Okay, so he says, as a result, God would be perfectly listen just. In allowing all of us to spend eternity in hell. Notice he didn't say a lot. God is not allowing. This is the problem with this kind of stuff. There's the word allow right there. The doctrine doesn't say that he is allowing us to spend eternity in hell. It says he's predestined us to hell or to heaven. Do you get it? It's not a choice. He says, okay, however, God chooses to save some of us. He's not being unfair to those who are not chosen because they were not they are receiving what they deserve. Now hold on a minute. Does this make sense to anybody? God chose these guys. Did they deserve it? If he says no, then what is the deciding factor between these guys and the others who are predetermined? And I would, if I could talk to somebody about this who held this position, I would drill into their head. Remember, they are predetermined from the foundation of the world, aside from their works before they were ever born. So it has nothing to do with whether they had faith or not, because they weren't born yet. Go ahead. Exactly. They would, of course, they would. But the problem is, they he still made them condemned or not before they ever lived. Sure, they for, he foreknew them. The problem is they have an they have a misunderstanding of what it means to foreknow. Okay, if they said, well, he knew beforehand. Yeah, he did. But once again, when you do a study on the word foreknow, because he says right here, he says, let me get back to my place here. He says, let me get back to my place. Okay. All right. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined, right? Question. Who does God not foreknow? Somebody say it loud enough the camera can pick it up. Nobody. Nobody. Okay. So in your word, what you have said, if they rebut that and say, well, they, he knows everything ahead of time, right? Foreknow. You have to ask this question. For whom he foreknew, he also what? Predestined. Predestined to what? Be conformed to the image of his son. Thank you. Who did he not foreknow? No one, right? So he foreknows everyone, right? Right? Yes. Okay, I'm talking to you back there because you brought it up. Okay? Does he foreknow everyone? Yes, right? From the front. So does that mean everybody's going to be conformed to the image of his son? Huh? It has to, according to their doctrine. In other words, if they come to me and say, wait a minute, he knew they would do this beforehand, I'd say, you're right. But if the scripture says, if he foreknew it, he predestined those same people he foreknew to be conformed to the image of his son. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have it both ways. Either you are predestined and have no choice, or you are not. Understand? Here's what he says. All right. He's not being unfair to those who were not chosen because they were not re they were receiving what they deserve. God's choosing to be gracious to some is not unfair to others. 
No one deserves anything from God, therefore no one can object if he does not receive anything from God. Okay, but here's my question. Why? Justice says there has to be a reason for something. Right? Yeah, I see the crossed eyes. It doesn't make sense. Because you've got 100% of people that have ever lived, and according to this doctrine, a portion of them have received God's favor arbitrarily because they didn't deserve it either, did they? So arbitrarily, without reason, and in spite of good reason and reasoning ability, God has chosen these people and just kicked everybody else to the curb. That is not a just God. That's not how justice works. Okay, so listen. He says... Let me catch my space, my place here. Okay, he gives an illustration. This is a terrible illustration. Okay, I'm not even sure I'm going to read it because it's a ridiculous um, illustration. All right, if God is choosing who is saved, doesn't that undermine our free will to choose and believe in Jesus? The Bible says we have choice. All who believe in Jesus will be saved. Okay, well. We know that they don't agree with how people are saved. Okay, we'll just set that argument aside for a minute. Okay, let's just say for a minute that they have that part right, which they don't. Okay, there are certain people going to be saved if they obey the gospel. We'll say that, okay? That's true, right? If you obey the gospel, you'll be saved, right? Okay, so we have a choice to obey the gospel or not. The Bible never describes God rejecting anyone who believes in him or turning away from anyone who is seeking him. That's true. Anybody who comes to him, he won't, re he won't reject. That's true. Okay? Now listen, here's the next sentence. Somehow, and here's the problem, because 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourself approved in their God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling or write the word of God. Right? Th is this the revelation of God to man? Yes. Is this the revealed will of God to man? Yes. Does this tell us how we can be saved? Yes. yes. Does this tell us who God is? Yes. yes. Does it tell us how God has interacted with people? Yes. Does God leave those things as mysteries to us? No. No, he doesn't. However, here's what they say. Because they're not good students of the Bible. He said, somehow, right here, somehow, somehow, in the mystery of God... So now what they've done is they've excused themselves for not knowing the scriptures properly. They say, it's a mystery of God. Somehow, in a mystery of God, predestination, according to their doctrine, that is, people being saved by God's arbitrary choice and others not, somehow, in the mystery of God, predestination works hand in hand with the person being drawn by God. And how are we drawn by God? Through his word. Through his word, right? Through the gospel, right? Okay. And believing unto salvation, Romans 1.16. That's what they say. God predestines who will be saved, and we must choose Christ in order to be saved. Both facts are equally true. Now, what? Here's the problem. According to their definition of predestination, God selects these, selects these people before the foundation of the world individually or not before they ever do anything. Do you guys get that? Do, does that make do you see what they're saying? Because listen, I feel like I need to talk to the camera right now because I want to talk to the world. Predestination of a person occurs before they ever lived. True or false? In their doctrine. True. That's true. So how can you have that, which is an unchangeable designation by God, you're saved before you're ever born, how can you have that and the choice? How can you have that? You can't. You can't because they even say right in that one part there, it's a mystery of God to have a predestination works 
hand in hand with a person being drawn by God. Right. So you don't have free will. God selected you, predestined you, and you're in that mystery of God. You're going to be drawn to Him. Right. Whether you like it or not. Yeah. Go ahead. So in that line of thought, in this whole line of thought, why do they even need the Bible, which is all the instructions and everything to do, and why would they even care to have the Bible? If there's nothing you can do, why do you need instructions to explain it? Why would you need to be drawn by God through the Word? If I have if I have no feet, why do I need shoes? I mean, well, and here's the idea. Here's the problem. So you know, fun. Here's the problem with this. Does predestination exist in the Scripture? Yeah, it does. What is predestined? They say it's the person. But if you actually read the scripture, listen to what it says. Listen to what it says. It says, what, let's see here. Let me get back to where we were. Okay. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Foreknowledge requires a person to foreknow something, but also has built within it Greek grammar-wise, structurally, approval. Okay, remember that? Jesus said to those who say, Lord, Lord, did we even prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many wonders in your name, right? What did he say to them? Depart from me, you who workers of lawlessness, for I never knew you. I never knew you. Well, wait a minute. Did he not intellectually know them? Of course he did. What was it that he didn't do? He didn't approve of them. So this idea of foreknowledge includes approval. Those who he approved, he what? Also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And these he justified, he also glorified. When you look at that, and you look at places like Romans chapter 9, you see that there is the will of God involved. Right? What is the will of God? For all men to be saved. Okay. Then, what, not, what is the not, will of God? What is the will of God? Isn't this his expressed word right here? Is his expressed word his will? Yes. So guess what? Here's the thing. When we're talking about this, we're talking about people who have conformed to the will of God. Let me put it to you another way. Has God ever changed? No. no. Has his law changed? No. Yes. His law has changed. Oh, the new? Yes. His law has changed, right? The old has become obsolete, the new, right? His law has changed. When you look at God and how he treated those who lived before Christ, did he give them choices to obey or disobey? Were they, dis were they predestined also? Or is this only a Christian thing? You see, this is where their doctrine is full of holes and full of problems. Because they're only looking right here. They're going, okay, this verse is right here. We're going to make it say what we want it to say. Problem is, they would have to conclude that God who never changes predestined everyone from the beginning of time. That includes Adam and Eve. All the way to the last person who's ever born. That means under every law, there's people who are predestined. But then if you look at that, you have to realize that the choice God gave them to obey. If you obey my voice and hear and heed my statutes, right? Remember all these, you've, we've gone over this a hundred times. Deuteronomy 28, uh, Exodus chapter 19, you know? You will be blessed if you do these things. What is the point of giving a choice to a person who has no choice to do it because they're predestined? It doesn't make any sense. They have to make God either change who he is from the old to the new, or they have to make God a liar. Because God says you have a choice in the matter. God does not predestine the person. God predestines the plan, if you will. I don't like using the word like that. But God predestines what he will accept. And what does God accept? Christians. 
Well, he accepts Christians, but he accepts those who are obedient to him. Right? If those who are of the Old Testament obeyed his commandments, did he accept them? Yes. What if they disobeyed him? Did he accept them? No. Let me give you an example. Look at Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. In Hebrews chapter 3, it says here, in verse 7, Therefore the Holy Spirit says, Today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works uh, 40 years. Okay, so what's he talking about here contextually? He's talking about those who were wandering in the wilderness, right? Mm -hmm. Before they were a nation, but they were the chosen people, right? Coming out of Egypt. Okay? Where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They, will, they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, I accept them anyway. Is that what it says? They shall not. They shall not enter my rest. He rejected them. Why? Because they didn't obey him. God has always had that which he accepted. And if you, if a person or a group of people conform to what God accepts, then they are part of his people, period. Right? So what is it in fact that God predestinated? Well, Jesus Christ was foreordained from before the foundation of the world. That means the gospel of Jesus Christ was foreordained for the foundation of the world, Right? God's will for man was foreordained before the foundation of the world, right? That means that the plan, that is which, that which God deems acceptable to him, was foreordained. Any person who conforms to that is the predestined. That's just as simple as it is. Because here's the other part. When you take man's choice away from it, you have to say that if a person is saved, they are saved whether they want to be saved or not. They are saved whether they obey God or not. They can't lose any salvation that they have had because they don't have a choice. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why you have Calvinism. That's why you have this idea of total hereditary depravity. And they look at passages that don't teach that to try to prove that. That means you can't do anything good of your own. God has to work on you miraculously for you to believe, right? Unconditional election. Unconditional election. I'm grabbing you, put you over here, and you're saved whether you like it or not. It's unconditional. Okay? You have no choice in the matter. You can't do it yourself, so I'm going to drag you over here whether you want it or not. Limited atonement. He didn't die for everybody. He died for those only that he grabbed and plucked over here and favored somehow. Right? Irresistible grace. Irresistible. What does that mean? It means you can't resist it. it. means you're forced. You're forced. Irresistible grace. <laughs> and preservation of the saints has to be there. Preservation of the saints means you can't ever lose it because... You don't have a choice in the matter. You see how convoluted this is? That's where that doctrine came from. That doctrine came from a person who was trying to make it like God because he saw somewhere in the Word of God somehow injustice or something like that. I, I don't know. But when I look into the perfect law of liberty, I see God who created mankind with the ability to choose to love him or not to obey him or not. Don't you see that? I see that. I see a person who is born upright. God has made man upright, but he is from his youth gone astray. Scripture tells us, right? Okay, so God makes us upright. David is not saying he was sitting in the womb. Psalm 51, or Psalm 50, 51. I forget which one exactly it is. He's not saying that. God made man upright. God goes, or man goes astray. And when man goes astray, God says, I have extended to you my grace in Jesus Christ so that you may come back to me. That's the whole point, the entire point of the prodigal son. 
believe that's in Luke 15. That's the entire point of that. So what are we to do with this? I want to wrap this up tonight. I don't want to revisit this anymore. But I want us to understand that the doctrine of predestination as is prescribed by the religious world that says God has chosen people, individuals, uh, for salvation and others not is a contemptible heresy. Because that means that God is unjust because God made us in his image, did he not? Do we have a sense of justice? Of course we do. What if we had a bunch of children, just a bunch of kids, and we said, you know, Ella, as good as you are, nice as you are, I just don't like you enough. You know, send you away. Okay? But this person over here, no, no. Well, yo, okay, I love you. I, I love you, but I know, right? God is love. What if you had a bunch of these kids and you just took, let's say you had 100 kids. That's a lot of kids. But let's say you had 100 kids, but you only took one of them and set them aside because percentage-wise, very few are going to make it in heaven, right? So you take one and the rest of them, you say, oh, sorry, all you kids. You know, I love you, but I don't like you quite as much as this one over here. All y'all are going to be condemned to hell forever. Is that justice? What? How would you look at a person like that? Wouldn't you look at them? Don't you? Wouldn't you say they deserve justice from our government to be punished? You would punish a person who did that. Yet they're saying that's exactly what God does. I've heard it said in a way that you suppose you have two children and they're drowning. And you have the ability to save both of them. But you save one of them. Mm -hmm. While well, they're both screaming to the other one, screaming, I love you. I love you. But you don't save them. You've heard that as a justification? No, I've heard this as another example for it. This, what, this is what God would be like. You have the ability to save both children. And you stand, oh, I love both of you. And they're both screaming for you. Save oh. You save this child. <laughs> because I love you, but you still let the other one drown. Is that a really loving father? Well, here's my thought on that. At first, I thought you said no. you didn't have the ability to save both of them. No, they have, they have the ability to save both of them, but all you tell them one is, I love you, I love you, but you don't save them. Is that a love? Well, water? here's, let me add to that. You have, you have 500 kids yeah. in the water drowning, and you have the ability to save them all, but you choose two or three of them to save. That's what it's like. Yeah. Because there's a vast majority of people who are not going to make it to heaven because of their choice to follow other gods or to be atheist or whatever. So this idea, they say, here's what they say. They say, God predestines who will be saved, and we must choose Christ in order to be saved. There, you can't have both facts equally true. Either the door is open or it's closed at the same time, in the same moment, in the same way. It's not open and closed. Is that door open and closed right now? No, it's closed. It's either closed or open. You can't have a dichotomous statement both being true at the same time. And then he says this. Romans 11, 33 proclaims, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his path beyond tracing out. I want to know how they apply that to this. Well, that goes back to the mystery part, doesn't it? Yeah, but... Oh, that's the <laughs> office. I'm like, where's that phone come? Anyway... Here's my point. Yes, the depths of the riches of the wisdom of God, his, his judgments are unsearchable. But what they're saying is, yeah, I know this doesn't look good, but God's ways are harder than ours. That's what they're saying. I know it looks awful. I know what we're painting, the picture we're painting here doesn't look like, a, look like we're painting a just God, but his ways are higher than ours, and oh, it's all unsearchable, and they get all religious. But the problem is that leaves out reason. It leaves out study. It leaves out knowledge. It leaves out our understanding of how to be saved and who can be saved. It takes hope away from people. Because it's, how do you know if you're the ones that are going to be saved or not? How, how do you know? Does God, um, excuse me, John Smith, uh, come here. John, does he tap you on the shoulder and like you just get the, what? How do you know if you're the saved one or not? 
they would say, well, you would believe in Jesus. Here's the problem I have with that. Does James chapter 2 tell us anything about belief? If all it takes is for a person to believe in Jesus, because that's what they've said, right? Believe in Jesus? Are the devils predestined for salvation? Because James said that they believe in God. The problem is you have to twist the scriptures. So if you just let the scriptures teach us, you can know that God predestines that which he approves. That's what to foreknow means. God predestines what in the Old Testament, when it was the patriarchal age, what did he approve? He approved obedience to him, right? Here's the tree in the middle of the garden. Don't eat of it. If they didn't eat of it, they'd be fine, wouldn't they? They'd probably still be alive today. I don't know how that would work. But the point is, they wouldn't be condemned, right? He would accept them. How about the patriarchs? Those who offered sacrifices, Cain and Abel, right? God accepted one of them. He didn't accept the other one. Why? Is it because it's arbitrary or because he had that which he chose to accept and Cain didn't do it? So he rejected Cain. Was Cain predestined to be evil? No. God, Cain chose to do what he did. Stepping forward into the Israelites, when he made covenant with them, he told them, if you obey my commandments, then you'll be blessed. If you don't, you're going to be condemned. What was, the pre, what was the predestined condition? Obedience. It's always been obedience. Always. So it's the fact that God says, if you obey my will, if you obey my law, whatever law you lived under, patriarchal, uh, mosaic, Christian, whatever law, if you obey me, if you obey my voice, I will accept you. Isn't that what the scriptures teach as a general synopsis? Isn't it? Yeah, it is. God provided the way of our salvation in Jesus Christ. He extended the grace of God in Jesus Christ so that we have the ability to be saved. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God gave us the word of God so that we might have faith. We read the word of God and we generate faith in us and we obey Jesus Christ, we will be saved. It's that simple. But they have to go and construe it like this. And you got millions of people who don't understand because of it. This is not this is not the scripture. This is garbage. But you've got millions and millions of people believing this. You can search. It doesn't have to be this website. You can ask Charles Stanley. Ask any of these guys. This is They will have some form of this as their answer. In the mystery of God, in his knowledge which is far above ours. And they, they, they get religious. They, that's what they do. They become a religious person and oh it's God's mystery his ways are far above ours and we can't we can't find them out. Let me tell you something. If that applies to whether a person is saved or how they can be saved, we serve an unjust God. Because my Bible tells me how I can be saved. My Bible tells me who is going to be saved. And I can be either in line with that or not. And I can choose that or I can choose not to, right? I don't know what Bible they have. He has given us his word. He has revealed it to us. The last book of the Bible is called what? Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Apocalypsis means the revealing. It's not a mystery. It has been revealed to us. Oh. Anyway, I hope I've covered this subject well enough that we know what the truth of the matter is. Go ahead. To me, the predestination could be more of a warm guarantee. And looking at it, since it's, it's New Testament that it's in, it's guaranteeing that if you become a Christian, a true Christian, you don't have to wonder. I could be doing everything the Bible says and just being and, and truly doing everything and if he says nope not you I don't have to sit you know it's like I mean, why am I doing this but if I know that I do what it says I don't have to sit here and worry well, is he still going to choose me 
Right. No, I am guaranteed that I become a Christian. He is predest predestined Christians. Right. To that well, well, that's so right. That's, what you go that's who's predestined. It, that's right. It's comforting to know that God has predestined something. He predestines that which he accepts. It's that simple. If I do that which God accepts, he accepts me. And I can take comfort in that. I can have hope in that. I cannot have hope in that system. That's it. Anything else? Okay. 350 is our song. I'm going to hand the class over to you.